Hello again, everybody. We're going to talk about retinoblastoma here. Retinoblastoma is a neuroectodermal malignancy, and it comes from, what else? Retinal cells. And if you guessed that this is a tumor that tends to happen in young people, you guessed correctly. And it's generally a pretty safe bet that if something ends in blastoma, young people can get it. Uh, so this is a small round blue cell tumor of childhood, and other tumors uh, that are small round blue cell tumors of childhood include the neuroblastoma, the hepatoblastoma, Wilms tumor, uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, and so forth. So uh, this is a tumor of childhood, and as a matter of fact, it's really a tumor of infancy uh, and toddlerhood. Uh, so about five, uh, uh, the median age of diagnosis is about 15 months of age, and 90% of cases are diagnosed before five years of age. So this is, these are very young children we're talking about when we are considering retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma makes up about 2.5% of all childhood cancers from birth to 14 years. Uh, but that number would probably go up if you considered uh, the number, of, uh, the percentage of cancers from birth to three or four or five years of age. It occurs in approximately one in 15,000 live births in the U.S. Sadly, it accounts for 5% of childhood blindness cases, uh, and so uh, that's something to keep in mind. Re diagnosing retinoblastoma is not only important to save the patient's life, but it's also important to save the patient's vision. We want to diagnose this as quickly as we can for both reasons. So we know that retinoblastoma is linked to a very specific mutation, and that is a mutation of the gene that bears its name, the retinoblastoma gene, which is also associated with other cancers, uh, including osteosarcoma. Uh, but uh, this retinoblastoma gene is located on the long arm of chromosome 13. And this bears some importance because retinoblastoma can be heritable, meaning the child is born with a mutation uh, of that gene. Uh, so if a child is born with a germline or with, with a mutation of the retinoblastoma gene, they're considered to have heritable retinoblastoma. If uh, they are not born with a mutation uh, of the retinoblastoma gene, then it's considered non-heritable. We'll look at this in a little bit more detail, though. So there's what's called the two-hit hypothesis, and this can actually apply to other cancers, but it was actually discovered when researching retinoblastoma. The guy's name escapes me right now who came up with this. I think it's Knudsen. Uh, but uh, anyhow, so the heritable uh, the heritable form of acquiring retinoblastoma is where the child is born with one retinoblastoma mutation, and then the other is acquired after birth, and that results in a tumor. So about 90% of inherited mutations will develop spontaneously, and 10% of inherited mutations actually come from the parent. So uh, that's important to know because there's a 1 in 10 chance if the kid has a heritable uh, mutation, if, uh, if they have the heritable retinoblastoma, there's a 1 in 10 chance that one of the parents has the retinoblastoma gene and doesn't know, and that's that implicates their other children as well, or children that uh, they may have in the future. Uh, about 60% of the mutations that are heritable are germline mutations, meaning that it affects every cell in the body not just the cells in the retina. Uh, and that's important because if you have an RB1 mutation that affects every cell in the body, germline, then that's going to put you at risk for uh, other cancers. And we'll talk about that uh, towards the end. So heritable retinoblastomas have a tendency to present earlier since you only need to acquire one injury to the other uh, uh, to the other uh, allele. Um, and they also have a tendency to be bilateral because if you have that germline mutation, you already have an arid allele in the other eye. So you have an arid allele in your left eye, arid allele in your right eye. It, there, you, it's possible to, uh, to have bilaterality. I mean, it is possible with the non-heritable 
retinoblastoma to have bilaterality, but the chances are much lower because you'd have to acquire uh, four separate injuries, essentially. So the non-heritable retinoblastoma is where the child is born with no uh, RB1 mutations, and both mutations are acquired after birth. So you can imagine why this would have a tendency to present later because you have to get two separate injuries. And uh, this is more likely to be unilateral because you have to affect, you, you remember that a tumor arises from one cell, so you would have to be affecting two, uh, two cells at the same time. So that's less likely that a non-heritable retinoblastoma is going to be bilateral. So retinoblastomas that are heritable tend to be earlier and bilateral, uh, but they can be unilateral. Uh, retinoblastomas that are non-heritable have a tendency to present relatively later uh, and uh, are more likely to be unilateral. And when I say later, I'm talking more like two or three years of age as opposed to uh, six months of age. Overall, 70 to 80 percent of retinoblastomas on presentation are unilateral and 20 to 30 percent are bilateral. So the symptoms of retinoblastoma include uh, the leukocoria, and leukocoria is something you should be well aware of. Uh, it's not pathognomonic for retinoblastoma, but when a child has leukocoria, it's retinoblastoma until proven otherwise, because we need to disprove retinoblastoma in any child with leukocoria, especially the really young ones, because retinoblastoma is deadly. So leukocoria is the white reflection off of the retina, and normally it should be red or orange. Uh, and this can go undiagnosed or unnoticed until, sadly, much too late, because Parents aren't at home shining lights into their kids' eyes all the time and looking at their retinas. You know, maybe maybe you might do it because you, know, you might have an ophthalmoscope, but most parents aren't doing that. So what you might get, though, is a parent who is observant and you know, taking pictures, you've got a flash, and while everybody else has red eyes, because remember that's just the flash bouncing off your retina, the baby has a white eye and a red eye, or maybe two white eyes. And that white uh, white eye is the leukocoria. So the parent might notice it, but really this is something that usually will be noticed in the clinic. Strabismus can also uh, present. Um, it's a little less common. Only about one in five children with retinoblastomas will have strabismus, and that's just due to the fact that this is affecting vision. Other ways that this can present but are a little less common in the U.S. because it, this tends to get diagnosed a little earlier now, uh, especially since we have uh, newborn uh, exams and six-month exams. Uh, uh, can be proptosis if this gets to be large enough, ocular asymmetry, certainly a deterioration in vision, uh, eye pain and glaucoma, and orbital cellulitis, and if it gets big enough, it can cause orbital invasion. You can also see uh, hyphema, which is due to uh, destruction in the anterior chamber, and it causes bleeding into the anterior chamber. I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. Once you see it once, you'll never forget it. So when you have a child that has leukocoria, the best initial step is uh, going to be an immediate ophthalmologic examination. Um, and that's because leukocoria is retinoblastoma until proven otherwise. We need to rule this out. Uh, so you're going to do this under general anesthesia, and this, of course, is going to be done by a pediatric ophthalmologist. And the tumor will appear as a whitish-pink creamy mass. Uh, what you can also do uh, is get a... Uh, I don't think you'll be presented with the two of these as choices. Um, you can also get a, a CT or MRI. Usually MRI is preferred because it doesn't expose, expose the child to as much ionizing radiation. You can get a CT MRI of the, of the orbit, and uh, that can help you uh, determine whether uh, it's retinoblastoma too, but it, it can't do it definitively. So uh, you'll want to get a CT uh, or MRI, usually an MRI, uh, for the reasons stated, um, and that can help you see uh, if there's any kind of tumor-like process there. And sometimes the ophthalmologist may want that, uh, before doing the ophthalmologic examination, but that examination needs to be done. So uh, 
I guess as far as initial step, you may go with an MRI first and then send them off to ophthalmology. But I wanted to underline that the fact that this is an examination that needs to be done in a child with leukocoria. Okay, so once, uh, what, what are you going to look for on the MRI? You're going to look for extraocular extension, uh, infiltration, uh, and particularly invasion of the optic nerve. So those are some things that uh, will point towards uh, retinoblastoma, especially if there's calcifications uh, in the eye. Intraocular calcifications are practically pathognomonic for retinoblastoma. So if you've diagnosed the child with retinoblastoma, or the ophthalmologist has, uh, then you're going to get bilateral bone marrow biopsies and a CSF cytology, and this is, uh, to, uh, this is done for prognostication purposes. So if there are retinoblastoma cancer cells in the bone marrow or in the CSF, that is a really grim prognosticator. So that's bad news. What we're not going to do uh, is a biopsy of the tumor. So usually when you think it might be cancer, you think, okay, good, i got to get a biopsy, but that's not here. Uh, biopsy of the tumor is not performed because there's a risk of seeding the vitreous, and that can make things worse and uh, increase the risk of spreading. So a biopsy of the tumor, not performed. This is uh, diagnosed uh, by the ophthalmologist uh, on examination uh, with imaging uh, as collaborating evidence. Okay, so here's leukocoria. You've probably seen this before. Here's another one. And another one. So you can see this eye here is red, and this eye here is white. White is yellow. So again, here's, this one's bilateral. Okay, this is the hyphema I was talking about. So if the tumor uh, spreads and invades the, uh, into the anterior chamber, you can get bleeding into that uh, closed space. And so you can see here, it's just like blood pooling in the anterior chamber in front of the pupil and the iris. So if they were to turn, you know, the blood would move with it. You can also get orbital cellulitis. This is less common because uh, usually the kids will come in, uh, parents bring the kid in way before this and way before some of the other pictures I'm going to show you. But orbital cellulitis can uh, occur with retinoblastoma. This child did not have retinoblastoma, but this is what orbital cellulitis looks like. And then orbital invasion would be sort of the last stages if you let this go unchecked. Uh, so these tumors can grow to be really big. And you know, these are all in third world countries. This doesn't happen in the U.S. They don't present like this. But in, in, in countries that are uh, poorer, uh, where they don't have medical, uh, good medical care, uh, they can go this long. So this is what a retinoblastoma would look like on ophthalmologic examination. So it's just this whitish, kind of creamy, clumpy looking mass. Uh, and there are vessels on it, and that goes for most tumors, uh, most cancers, because they need a blood supply too. So here's another one. They all look a little different, but it's also note the uh, extensive blood supply. And then here's another one up here. This is a composite. So when you're looking with the ophthalmoscope, uh, when the ophthalmologist does their exam, they're only you only see a, a small circle, so they're just adding the uh, they're just adding the, those circles to the map here. And so here is a uh, what appears to be a CT. Uh, so here's your uh, calcifications. Here's your tumor, and then there's calcifications here. Um, this is an extensive uh, calcification, uh, so this would be uh, the affected eye here. Uh, here's a T2 weighted image. Uh, so everything, basically, this is your negative MRI. Um, so uh, here's the tumor here. It's black here. Okay. 
I don't expect you're going to get images uh, on step two or step three. I've never seen a question with retinoblastoma images. Most of the questions are pretty straightforward. How do you diagnose it? Um, how does it commonly present leukocoria? What do you do? Referral to ophthalmology, get an ophthalmologic examination, get a CT, MRI, etc. And also don't biopsy. Okay, what do we do to treat retinoblastoma? As of now, still the mainstay of therapy is external beam radiation. Uh, however, chemotherapy as a neoadjuvant is being used more and more. Uh, and that's to reduce the tumor bulk before the radiation. Because when you radiate the retina, you're going to get, a, you're going to get damage to the retina. And the thought is... Well, if we can get the tumor smaller before we radiate, we don't need to radiate as much of the retina, and we can preserve better vision in the, the eye. Uh, so chemotherapy before radiation is being done more and more, but still the answer on the USMLE for treatment is external beam radiation for retinoblastoma. If there is metastatic disease, then you're going to do chemotherapy no matter what. If the eye is non-salvageable, then, uh, or it doesn't respond to cure with radiation uh, and or chemotherapy, then uh, the eye is going to be enucleated. You're just going to take it out. The five-year survival is pretty good if it's diagnosed early, and it's miserable if it's metastasized. So the five-year survival is greater than 90% if the tumor is confined to the orbit. If there's invasion of the uh, of, of the uh, of the optical nerve optic nerve, uh, it's 40 percent. And if there are distant metastases, the uh, five-year survival is pretty much unheard of. So uh, this is definitely uh, underlines how important it is to diagnose this promptly, uh, get prompt referral to an ophthalmologist. The child who has retinoblastoma may be at an increased likelihood of developing primary malignancies. Uh, and that all hitches on whether or not they have the germline RB1 mutation. So if they acquired both of the mutations after birth, or if they acquired one in utero and the second one after birth, then they're fine. But if it's a germline mutation, meaning that every single cell in their body has the retinoblastoma mutation on one allele, then they have an increased likelihood of developing subsequent primary malignancy. So one you really have to look out for is osteosarcoma. And remember the rough age when you develop osteosarcoma, that uh, tumor that affects the femur, roughly around 15 to 25 years of age. So that's something uh, that they should be well aware of. There's genetic testing that can be done for all children who have retinoblastoma to determine whether or not it's a germline mutation. Uh, and that can be performed on family members uh, to see if they carry it as well. And so genetic counseling is also something to include in the treatment of the child with retinoblastoma. But external beam radiation. So all the rest of this is just uh, peripheral information. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to comment below.